investigations from the case files of Lieutenant Joe Kenda. First, police find death and destruction in a quaint family home. Bullet holes in the ceiling, bullet holes in the wall. We can't even get inside because the doorway is blocked by the body. This is like some sort of Quentin Tarantino movie. Then, a 58-year-old mother of four is left for dead. Her face was all beat up. Her throat was red. It's an uncommon thing to see a victim who's been assaulted three different ways. I cannot imagine the horror of finding out what happened to their mom. Why did they kidnap this woman? Why are they torturing her like a cat tortures a mouse? No. They have a reason for doing this. It might be an insane reason, but it's a reason. I don't want to die this way. The human's first instinct is to lie. It begins when you're four years old. Did you eat that cookie? Oh, no, I didn't do that. Self-preservation, particularly when you know you've done something wrong. There's one thing that never changes. Murder. A life has been taken. Their stories are now my stories. I never know where a case is going to lead, but I'll never stop until it's solved. Somebody has to look out for the victim. If you kill, I will find you.
looks like he took fire from two different weapons. He has a 38 caliber handgun loosely in his right hand. He has a gunshot wound to the upper thigh and his right leg, and he has a massive shotgun wound to the right side of his chest. Get some shells over here. Laying next to one blood pool is a 38 caliber revolver, and next to the other blood pool on the carpet is a shotgun. They also noticed two shotgun shells laying on the floor. What happened here? Bullet holes in the ceiling, bullet holes in the wall by the front door and by the kitchen. These weapons would match the wounds we observe in Jerry Bowers. This is like some sort of Quentin Tarantino movie. This guns that were used. Crazy. So when you look around further, there's some soda and some food on the table, some knitting needles and crochet work. It's as if these people were having a quiet evening at home and were surprised by someone coming in armed with a gun. Why don't I head over to the hospital? See if the two surviving dicks can give us an idea what happened. I'm going to touch base later. So Barry and I decide to split our forces and I'm going to remain there and talk to this guy who called 911. His name is Ted Klinkscales and he's in the company of a uniformed officer at the scene. So the couple that were shot, did you know them well? Yeah, yeah, pretty well. Friends with both of them. He said CC was a homemaker. Tony worked for Ampex, which is an audiovisual company in town. So they seem to have a real stable, quiet life. Do you know if they'll be okay? Well, they're in critical condition right now, so it'll go either way at this point. Oh my God, any word on the baby? The baby? Yeah, CC is pregnant. She's doing a couple of months. We've got two people at death's door, and now maybe we have a third one. After speaking with the witness, Kenda contacts Detective Barry at the hospital for an update. All the victims are still in surgery. Tony was shot in the neck, but I think it's going to be all right. The female CC was shot once in the arm and once in the stomach. That's not good. Just found out she's pregnant. Yeah, I just found out myself. It doesn't look promising. Any news on the caliber of the gun that caused the injuries? Yeah, 22 rounds. 22? That's right. Well, there's no 22 caliber gun in that apartment laying on the floor. And Bowers' gun is in his hand, and it's a 38. So who had the 22? All right, I'm going to head out of here. See back to the station. Whatever. Excuse me, are you police? Detective Barry was approached by a lady. She had heard that her brother had been shot and had come to the hospital to find out what she could find out about this shooting. No one inside will tell me what's going on. What's your brother's name? Jerry Bowers. Detective Barry knew that Jerry Bowers was deceased at the apartment. Very sorry, ma'am. Your brother's dead. There's really no easy way to tell somebody that news. No! And of course, she... Can I ask you a few questions? I'm going to just get her back to my car. This woman becomes inconsolable, and her friend puts her in the car. So when this guy comes back, he's quite shocked that this has happened. He said, I can't believe it, that he's dead. I just can't believe that. He says, my name is Byron, Byron Myers. And the lady that's with him is Jerry Bauer's sister, Beulah Williams. Do you know anything about why Jerry was murdered? Nah, I'm just a friend. I drove Beulah over here. That's all I know, I swear. Barry thought that was unusual. So he says, I'm going to need to talk to her later. I need her phone number and where she lives. I'm going to take away your driver's license. And by the way, I need your name and your phone number and where you live, too. Meanwhile, back at the crime scene, Kenda picks up a new lead. Detective Kenda. This is Randy Baker. And he said, this is a witness that has just decided to come forward. He also lives upstairs in this house. And I said, so what, what do you have to tell me, Randy? Do you know anything about what happened in the apartment earlier tonight? Yeah, I was there. You were in the apartment when the shooting took place. That's right. Oh, my, Randy. You really are 
kind of witness I've been looking for. We're investigating the death of Jerry Lee Bowers, who shot twice in this apartment on Willamette Street. And the man and woman who lived there are also shot. And the woman is seven months pregnant. We've now developed a witness who said he was present when everyone got shot in this apartment. He identified himself as 18-year-old Randy Baker. Let's walk me through what happened. Well, sure, I was... Uh taking out the trash, then all of a sudden, I felt something dig into my back. Don't do anything stupid. We're going up to Tony's apartment, all right? Randy said that he was scared to death and didn't dare look behind him to see who this person was, but that he could also hear two other people talking behind him. Pete. How do you know him? According 
According to Byron, he met Pete at a party with Jerry Bowers, and they discussed how to make a quick buck. Bowers says he knows a drug dealer named Tony, and he says he's got a wife that's pregnant, so they're not going to fight back. We could rob them. And Pete says they sound like the perfect targets. So we drove over there to see what's up. Where's Tony Spice? All the way up the end. Jerry's on this guy taking out the trash. Yo, I know that kid. He's friends with Tony. Byron says that Bowers identified Randy as a friend of Tony's. Stay right there and don't turn around. We're going up to Tony's apartment, all right? And they marched him to Tony's apartment door and got entry. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! And all of a sudden, I hear bang, bang, and a bunch of screaming. So I tore out of there and went in the car. Byron says, in a couple of minutes, Pete comes out, and he says, Jerry's dead, and I shot those two other people. We got to get out of here. What's Pete's last name? Cordero? How about where he lives? So, you know that? Yeah. And it gives us an address for Pete Cordero. I dropped him off at his place when we left. I said, well, I appreciate that, Byron. You've been extremely helpful. And he's smiling at me, and I said, by the way, Byron, you're under arrest. Please stop. What do you mean? Aggravated robbery and attempted murder. Oh, come on. Hands behind your back. You're right to remain silent. After dropping Byron off in booking, detectives head out to find Pete Cordero. Do you guys know what to do? We take two other officers with us. Pete's a shooter. He's not just a guy with a gun. He's a guy who doesn't have any trouble using a gun. Police, open up! We knock on the door and there's no reply. They're thinking as well, is he in there? Is he hiding from us? We'll go around the other side. Uh, wait here. Can I go around that side? So they start walking around the house looking through windows and stuff. No sign of him. Nothing on this side. Looked like the house had been somewhat ransacked. Like Sorry. We're after him. I just wonder what kind of head start they got. We need to get our hands on Pete Cadero. He is running. We just don't know in what direction. We are in pursuit of the third and final suspect. Police, open up! In a multiple shooting event where two people were shot, including a pregnant female, and one person is dead. Detectives have learned that their suspect, Pete Cordero, is on the run and may be headed out of state. So they run a records check on him and find out that Pete is actually on parole out of the state of California. So we contact the California authorities because when fugitives become fugitives, they're predictable. They run home. In the meantime, Kenda and Barry hope the two surviving victims, Tony Wake and Cornelia Cobre, will be able to make a statement. I need you to take it easy with them. Their injuries are substantial, and they have months of recovery ahead of them. Of course. And uh, what about Cece's baby? Is she going to be okay? Amazingly. Yes. The doctor says, well, it's a miracle, but that slug went through her abdomen and never touched that baby. Baby's just fine. And she's going to have a normal birth. Thanks, Doc. I'll take Tony and take these two. Feeling any better? Not really. But I'll get there. When you walk into a room like that, the purpose is to present yourself as friend as a person that doesn't know anything about this event just to see what he'll say can you tell me a little bit about what happened well cc and i we were just relaxing and i heard a knock at the door and i looked through the peephole it's randy so i let him in hey randy oh whoa, my god whoa. oh my god what the hell are y'all doing but there were these guys behind him 
says a guy forces Randy into the apartment. And he's immediately followed by two more guys who both have guns. And what do they want? Everyone call? No, you heard. Where's the money? Where's the staff? I don't keep no cash here. I know you have it somewhere. They want the cash. Where's the dope? We. Tony tells Detective Kent that I've been selling marijuana on the side. With the baby coming, I wanted to get some more cash saved up. That's remarkably honest. To tell me the truth. That he's selling drugs. I sold to Jerry Bowers. Yo, I know that kid. He's friends with Tony. So I guess he led him there. Tony becomes a star witness at this point because he's already implicated himself in a criminal act. So you knew Jerry. What about the other two guys? Byron. Everyone's cool, no one be hurt. I seen him around town, but the third guy, the Mexican, I don't know. We identified him as Peter Cordero. So what happened once they were all inside? Look, man, I told you, I don't keep... Tony, them. don't mess around. Just tell him where it's at. Cece realizes it's not worth getting killed over. Why don't you tell me where it is? Well, she tells Pete that they keep it under the sink in the kitchen. Pete can't seem to find anything under the sink, although it's there. He doesn't find it can't find it under there. Where is it? So he comes out, he looks at her and says, Hey, b If you kill your husband for lying to me. Fires three shots. At Tony on the ground. Tony says that Byron ran out when those shots were fired. And then someone knocked on the door and Pete answered it and stuck a gun out. Beat it! Which matches exactly with what the 911 witness had told us. That knock on the door is probably what saved people's lives. While the gunman's attention is focused on the door, CC makes a move. Gives CC the opportunity to reach under the couch and pull out their gun. Get out of my house, you prick! CC was able to actually hit Jerry in the thigh with one of the shots, and, and Jerry went to the floor. Tony said he knew that was his last chance to save his family, and he crawled into the bedroom to get his shotgun. Get out! Get out! I'll shoot you, When he came out, he saw Jerry Bowers and Pete pointing their guns. No, wait! And he fired that shotgun. At that point, Jerry went down and did not get back up. He fired another round at Pete. Going out there. A guy named Pete was drunk or was high, and he was agitated and yelling and screaming and waving his gun around. And I guess they must have shot him when I went for my shotgun. Tony said he heard sirens in the distance, and the next thing he remembered, he woke up in a hospital. But you gotta understand. I don't want to shoot nobody. I don't want to kill anybody. But they had guns on CC and my baby. I understand. There's no question in my mind that Tony and CC were acting in their own defense. Irrespective of the narcotic sales, these are home invaders who are armed. They fire the first shots, and Tony and his wife respond in kind. Absolute, clear self-defense. So now we know what happened here. We have Jerry Lee Bowers down and dead at the scene. We have Byron Myers under arrest. The only loose end here is Pete Cordero. But it's not long before Cordero shows up in California. Freeze, don't move! Pete was located in Lodi, California. The chain's in there. Put down your knees. Pete was arrested and eventually extradited back to Colorado Springs. Pete is found guilty by a jury and sentenced to 15 years for first-degree burglary and first-degree assault. Byron Myers pleads guilty for his participation in the robbery and is sentenced to 11 months. You want me to push him? No, I'm fine. Good. Tony.
Tony and Cece did not face any charges for the shooting of uh, Jerry Bowers. Both were acting in self-defense, and because of their cooperation in this case, uh, it was decided that no criminal charge would be brought against them for the marijuana charge. Tony learned from his mistake, and so did his wife. They understood the mistake they made, and they made the right choice following that. Jerry Lee Bowers never had the chance. He made his choice and died as a result. Coming up, Kenda must track down a monster who brutally attacked an older woman. She's been stabbed multiply in the chest, beaten in the face. Someone tried to strangle her when that failed. They used a knife on her chest. Blood. There is bloody clothing, one shoe, and a purse. 
purse. Is there anything missing? Where's her gold necklace? A gold necklace. I don't know why it was important to her. She loved that necklace. Um, she wore it a lot. It looked really good on her. She never takes it off. Well, she's not wearing it now, so that's been removed. Has it been stolen, or was it broken during the assault? It's hard to say. Meanwhile, Detective Arms arrives at the location where trucker Carl Walker found the secret. At this stage, we don't have the victim's car, so that might be in the area somewhere. So what are we looking for? All right, so we're looking for the spot where the body was, where she was stabbed. Should be a depression in the grass. Right there. I was able to find an area that had the plant soil kind of tamped down. Hey, Clemens. Hey. Check this out. And I found what looked like maybe a couple of drops of blood. I'm thinking this is probably a crime scene. I was looking for a knife, but didn't find one. Another key piece of evidence is also missing. We still don't have Sigrid's car. At this point in time, we're sort of dependent on the aid of other law enforcement agencies because that's going to be a big key. You might think about going home and getting some rest. We're trying to push out a daughter who's been singing the praises of the level of toughness of her mother when one of the nurses comes up and proves the point. I have some amazing news. Sigurd is out of surgery. She's still a little groggy, but she keeps saying that she wants to talk to the police right away so they can catch the guys that did this. My thought was, you're certainly right about your mother. She is one tough woman. I'm told that Sigrid Griswold was the victim of an assault and a stabbing and her car is missing. Mr. Griswold? Well, we've been informed that she's determined to tell us exactly what happened. Well, kind of, kind of, I'd like to ask you a few questions if you're feeling up to it. Miss Griswold is in poor shape when we see her. She has blood trauma injuries to the face and to the neck, but she has a fire in her eye. Yes, I want you to catch those bastards. I had pulled over near where the concert was taking place. Your keys, give them to me now! No! This man came up to my car, shoved me over to the passenger side. No! Some other guy jumped in the back seat. Once the second man jumps into the back seat of the car, <laughs> she realizes she's in trouble. Let go of me! Get out of my car! And that she's getting kidnapped. Did they try to rob you? They looked in my purse. <laughs> but I think they were just after my car. You've seen too much, lady. I'm sorry. <laughs> and that's when it happened. She says the guy behind her tries to strangle her with his hands. And then he says, my right hand doesn't work right. And he releases his grip on her. Before I had a chance to catch my breath. And he says to her from behind, you're a tough old lady, why won't you die? She distinctly remembers him saying that. They pulled over somewhere. No, no, no. And dragged me out of the car. What? What? Let me go! Shut your f***ing mouth. Sigrid says they stabbed her a number of times, they beat her, and ultimately they left in her car. I never really got a good look at the guy behind me. But the driver, though, he was probably in his 30s. He had dark hair and a mustache. Uh, did they ever say where they were going? They talked about going to Los Angeles and driving through Albuquerque. Now, the reason that makes sense is I-25 and I-40 is the only route that you can take out of central New Mexico to go to California. There's no doubt that's their route. Detectives update their APB, including a description of the driver. And hours later, they get a hit. Anthony, you see that car in the back of the parking lot? That blue vehicle? That APB. Yeah, but... 
the driver doesn't have a mustache. You don't get tied up in what they look like. But the guy in the back seat does. They're in her car. Let's go. Close enough. Get out with your hands up! They ordered them out of the car at gunpoint. Hey, I don't know anything about this. I was hitchhiking. That's the usual story. You don't listen to them. Put your hands on the hood of the car. If I was the arresting officer, I'd say, well, you hitchhiked with the wrong guy now, didn't you? You're under arrest. The two occupants of the car were Wallace Glenn Eckersley and Daniel Immel. They were both placed into custody and elected not to talk anymore without the presence of an attorney. A few weeks into her recovery, Secret is brought to the police station. I remember when they came out. You can see them, but they can't see you. Send them in. I want you to take a look at all of them and see if you recognize anyone. It is very critical that our victim assist the police in identifying who these individuals were, that they were not hitchhikers. They were the only individuals along the way that were involved in this. That's him. The third man there. She was immediately able to identify Wallace Glenn Eckersley as the driver of the car. Are you positive it's him? Oh, yeah. I'll never forget that face. Not after what he did to me. Take number three out. Now we want to identify Mr. Immel, who's the backseat occupant. What about the other guy? Is he there? Why, well, I, I never really saw him because he was behind me. She says, I closed my eyes. I didn't want to see them killing me because I thought I was going to die. Do you recognize his voice? Oh, yeah. So we decided to do an audio lineup. We got six people that have a similar tone to their voice, one of whom is Mr. Immel. I'm going to put the blindfold on you so you're not influenced by anything, okay? Okay. Doing an audio lineup is very unusual. It's the only one I ever did in my career. Number one, step forward and say the line. You're a tough old lady. Why won't you die? We asked each of the individuals to make the same exact phrases. You're a tough old lady. Why won't you die? Step forward and say the line. You're a tough old lady. Why won't you die? You're a tough old lady. Why won't you die? That's the guy that was in the back seat. Are you sure? I'm absolutely so certain. That's him. And it was Daniel Emmel. Room number four. During the process, Emmel's attorney suggested he as to why and what they did to Mrs. Griswold. Kenton has a clear picture of how the crime unfolded. It began with a few drinks at a local watering hole. Daniel Immel is a drunk by his own admission, and so is Glenn Eckersley. They become friends. Man, it's going to take a long time to hitchhike all the way from Colorado to L.A. And they decide they're going to hitchhike to California because that's where Eckersley is from. Maybe it's a faster way. How about we steal a car? The typical criminal plan occurs in less than five minutes through a haze of alcohol and drugs. And this is no exception. I like it. Yeah. Hey, buddy, can we get two more over here? Hey, what about her? She doesn't look like she'll put up much of a fight. Let's do it. Your keys, give them to me now. No! guys are intoxicated they're criminals it's like it's some game they're playing except it's not a game you're not too bad for an old broad i don't want to die this way but you're not gonna break your neck no. so maybe you should she's gonna be able to identify us if we just let her go now it became much more serious now they're talking they were gonna have to kill them. no no i won't I promise you've seen too much i'm sorry no no stop stop wanting to strangle her and can't get it done because of the weakness in his right hand. He had been involved in a drunk driving accident a handful of years ago that caused this permanent damage. So he was unable to choke her to the point of causing death. God, you're a couple lady. Why won't you die? Don't you have a gun? Just get it over with. She's hoping that if they're 
actually going to kill her. She wants it to be fast. I don't have a gun, but I do have this. Let me pull over, man. You don't have that blood in the car, man. No! So they get her out of the car. Please, no, no! And she says, I refuse to die like this. Please, no! No! Let me go! Please. They push her down on the ground. And stabs her in her breastplate. She feels enormous pain when she's stabbed. But she thinks it's in her interest to play dead. So she does. Come on. She's dead. Get out of here. She walks out to the highway, and finally a trucker stops. Wallace Glenn Eckersley is convicted of second-degree kidnapping and attempted second-degree murder. He is sentenced to 40 years. Daniel Immel pleads guilty to second-degree kidnapping and is sentenced to 36 years. I was satisfied with the outcome of the trial. My mom was satisfied. She actually forgave the two guys. This is the necklace that my mom um, lost. We found the necklace, and that was just a gift. It was a gift. She was an incredible mother. She took time for the kids always. This particular case is a case of someone demanding to survive when the odds are overwhelmingly against her. She was just not going to put up with being a victim of a violent crime. Mrs. Griswold is tough. Two murder investigations from the case files of Lieutenant Joe Kenda. First, police must solve the murder. Run away without getting killed themselves. The officer jumped into action, stood out in the middle of the street. The driver continues to advance toward him. Stop the car! Stop now! Then, two men are shot, and Kenda must figure out which was the aggressor. Mr. Pitts has two in his stomach, and Mr. Doe has one in his head. I ain't pulling no trigger. It's a rarity when something comes out and just tells us the whole thing. I'm telling the truth. He knows he's lying. I know he's lying. <laughs> People get into arguments, it simmers for an extended period of time. The bad blood remains, and it comes to a boil, and when it boils over, somebody's going to die. There's one thing that never changes. Murder. A life has been taken. Their stories are now my stories. I never know where a case is going to lead, but I'll never stop until it's solved. Somebody has to look out for the victim. If you kill, I will find you. It was a warm, sunny day in Colorado Springs, and um, Anthony Hayes, a Fort Carson medic, was returning home with some groceries. And he heard some guys arguing behind him. He hears a shot and sees one of the men is now laying on the ground. He grabs his medic bag and launches into action. Hang on, man. Where's the ambulance on the way? Hang on! Hang on! A short time later, Sergeant Kenda and Detective John Anderson arrive at the scene. The scene had been cordoned off. The victim had already been transported to the hospital by the paramedics. Hey, man. So are we at? The victim is a 27-year-old male. He's in critical condition. The victim is a Darrell Davis. He has a close-range gunshot wound to the central chest, and the EMTs who treated him reported that it was unlikely he would survive. Any witnesses? Just one. He's over there. I didn't see any casings on the ground. Did our guys already pick them up? No, sir. We didn't see any when we arrived on. The shooter has a revolver 
and the casings are contained within the weapon, or he picks up his expended casings because he knows they're evidence. Let's get a couple of guys to look around for a casing or two. Want to talk to the witness? Sure. Thanks. The witness says he looks across the street and sees a person fall from being hit with gunfire. I'm a medic. Oh, I can help him, but there wasn't much I can do. So you didn't see the shooter? No. But I did see his truck. It was a red truck and had bumper stickers on the back. I couldn't read him. He didn't see a license plate. He didn't know if there was more than one person in the truck. He just knows it fled immediately after the shot was fired. If you think of anything else, you let us know? Yes. Thanks. Excuse me, detectives. I have an update on the victim. EMTs have reported back that the victim was dead on arrival at the hospital. Do we have home address? Yeah, medical got it from the license in his wallet. Okay, uh, hold on the scene. We'll be back. Yes, sir. So we, of course, wish to notify the next of kin. We determined that he does have a wife who lives in the area, and we respond to that location and inform her of the death of her husband. Wait for a recovery period to take place and then interview her about her knowledge of her husband's activities. Are you answering your questions for us? I'll try. We wanted to find out when the last time she saw him, what the circumstances were. She said he came home early from work at about 2.30 in the afternoon, very upset, very agitated, said he'd quit his work. He kept going on and on and on about getting screwed. Man, on time every damn day. $128, babe? It's not fair, man. Darrell, calm down, okay, before you give yourself a heart attack. I'm tired of this. Asking me to be patient? Is the landlord going to be patient with us when it's time to pay rent? What kind of work did he do? He was in construction. He was on a job for about a week as a subcontractor. One of the dangers of working as a subcontractor as opposed to a salaried worker is that sometimes you can get shortchanged. They might refuse to pay you. But obviously he left at some point. Yeah. He said he was going to go look for Ken, his boss on his job. Now I'm not standing for that. Darrell! Darrell is Ken! You know he's going to pay me! Yeah, he's paying me today.
investigating the death of 27-year-old Darrell Davis, and we've been told by witnesses that a red pickup truck fled the area immediately after the shop was fired. Now, the same red pickup has returned to the crime scene. The officer steps into the street and pulls his weapon and puts it directly at the truck. Stop the car! Stop now! Hands! Hands! Show me your hands! Hands behind your back. Do it now. It's a felony arrest of an individual that's thought to be armed. Is he dead? He said, is he dead? As a question. The officer didn't reply to it. Well, you guys have sure been busy since we've been gone. Hey, roger that. Let's get a search warrant going for the truck. Get it towed back to the impound. Yes, sir. We're going to search this truck by warrant, but we can certainly see what's in plain view, either in the cab or in the bed of the truck, and we'd look at it before we do anything else. There's two things that really get our attention. One is a box of ammunition. The other is a spent shell casing that's on the floorboard. Hey, Joe. Come back here. Take a look at this. We look at the back of this truck, and there is a personal license frame that says protected by guns. There's also a bumper sticker that says I'm a Vietnam veteran. So what this is telling us is a little bit about this suspect. People display things that speak to their personality. He doesn't have flowers on his tailgate. You take people for what they say they are. This guy says he's a gun guy and he's used guns before. Okay, take him away. You got it. We have probable cause to arrest. We're gonna take him down to our office and talk to him there.
then stops telling a story, just, just pauses, and says, I didn't want to hurt anybody. I definitely didn't want to kill anybody. It's because of the war, man. The route was making threats, and it just... It just set me off. Ken explained that he kind of went into a defensive mode and that he had flashbacks to when he was in Vietnam. Come on, Ken! I'm not playing around! chest from inside the truck, which explains why that expanded casing is on the floor of the driver's side. Ken explained was uh, scared. He went back home. He uh, hid the gun. He changed uh, his clothes. So that shows a presence of mind. It shows conscious thought right after the shooting of this victim. Ken also insists he never intended to run down police upon returning to the scene. I came back to see if Darrell was all right. That's when you guys got me. But I swear, I did not want to kill him. Give me a sec. Hey, wait a minute. Oh. He's so upset and so shaking that he's physically ill. <laughs> he vomited. He was that upset about the circumstances. Is someone who's out of his emotional control. Mom. He responds to things in a violent way, but he's never committed a violent act. Why did that change now? In the other events in Milwaukee, it was a momentary confrontation and it broke. It ended. In this circumstance, Davis won't let it alone. Perhaps it's the prolonged nature of it that made him snap, but I suspect that's what was going on. Anderson, can you do me a favor? One second. Can you just shoot me? Right here and right now. I don't think I can live with this. When he makes that statement, it's obvious to me that he knows he's really messed up that his life's forever changed i knew that once we got to the county jail we were going to need to put him under a suicide watch later that day police execute a search warrant for ken muriel's home we discover the sawed off weapon between the mattress and box spring we then submit that weapon to the Colorado springs police department laboratory and they confirm through ballistic comparison that that is the murder weapon Ken is charged with second-degree murder, including a crime of violence. He pleads innocent by reason of insanity, and a jury bought the story. They eventually acquit him of the crime. However, the judge didn't let him off scot-free. It was decided that Ken Murrell would be ordered to the Colorado State Mental Hospital for a period of 12 years. Mr. Muriel has serious mental health problems. When agitated, he responds violently. Mr. Davis had no way of knowing that and certainly didn't deserve to die for it. But that was the end result. Are we going to treat Mr. Merrill as a criminal or as a victim? He's actually both. Coming up, a hallway shooting produces multiple bodies and countless questions. But who really pulled the trigger? They're not friends. They are enemies. You're going to have to get up off my block. I must say, you can tell when somebody's lying to you. And this guy was lying. Evening. <laughs> it's whatever you want, babe. I just want to make this day special for you. Godfrey Freeman is in his apartment talking to his girlfriend, trying to decide what they're going to do for Valentine's Day. Well, if you still want to do the Cliff House, I mean, that means we got to make reservations in the next... What the hell? What was that? Babe, I think I just heard gunshots. It sounded like it was... And before he can do anything, he hears another louder bang. He tells his girlfriend...
Friend to hold on. He starts to look out. Will you bring me that salad bowl? Sure. Thanks. It was nine o'clock on a Tuesday night. I'm home with my wife. I wonder who that could be. You know damn well who it is. It's the police department communications, sir. We have officers on scene of a fatal shooting. Okay, we're coming. Thank you. Well, be safe, honey. I will. Love you. Hey, Joe. Okay. That particular part of town, the southeastern part of the city, tended to have a high level of activity, a high level of gang activity, so we weren't surprised when we got a call to that address that there was a shooting. So what do we got? Looks like there was a shootout in the hallway of the apartment building. There were two victims. One was a 19-year-old Cameron Pitts shot twice in the stomach. The second party is an unknown black male shot in the back of the head. Both of our victims were transported to the hospital. Our John Doe that was shot to the head, looked like he's going to make it. Our other guy that was shot in the stomach, I'm not sure about him. So there are two blood stains in the hallway, one near the end of the hallway where the John Doe was discovered with a gunshot one of the head, and one in the center of the hallway a few feet away where Mr. Pitts was discovered. Nine millimeter? Yeah. There's also a nine your handgun recovered on the scene and officers tell us that it was near the hand of the John Doe. There are three expended nine millimeter casings on the floor. So we have three shots fired in the hallway. Mr. Pitts has two in his stomach and Mr. Doe has one in his head. Two people get in a confrontation for some reason, and the result of it is gunfire. And somehow or other, both of these people get shot with the same gun. Did you guys talk to the neighbors? We've started. We're still making our way through the building. Let me guess. No one's talking. Correct. It's the kind of place where gang activity is very common. And so a lot of the people in that area... They don't come forward with information. All right, well, there's no reason to quit. Let's keep talking to people. Okay. Sounds good. It's a subculture that most people never encounter, so it makes it extremely difficult to get useful information out of anyone. And you say to them, do you know this person? No, I don't know them. He's your brother. Do you remember that? That's how bad it is. We're investigating an altercation out here tonight. Did you happen to hear or see anything? Nah, I don't know. Did you happen to see anything or see anyone running or anything like that? I, I just don't want to be involved. Most of the neighborhood was very reluctant to talk to us. But we did find one individual identified by the name of Fitz Bannister. Excuse me. You live here? Yeah. Were you around when the shooting took place this evening? Yeah, I heard the shots. It was around like 8.30. It was actually right outside my apartment. He says he looks out the door and he sees two black guys laying on the floor bleeding. That's when I seen two white guys running. Can you describe it? Yeah, one of them was wearing all green, and the other white guy was wearing a gray baseball cap. Green was not a big gang color back then, and seeing a white guy dressed all in green would be a little unusual. Thank you. You're no problem. We're going to take what he says with some grain of salt, but we're also going to put out uh, all points to the cars in the area. Two white males, one wearing a gray baseball hat, one all dressed in green. You see him, stop him, identify him. As patrol officers continue their canvas, detectives check on the status of the shooting victims. Mr. Pitts has two round lugs in his stomach, but we're confident he'll pull through. What about our John Doe? Uh, Freddy's essentially brain dead. It's just a matter of time, unfortunately. They've been able to identify the victim. Not yet. 
who is he and how is he connected to Cameron Pitts? We can't find that out until we identify who this person is. Are the victim's clothes available? They're right over here. When you arrive in a hospital with a traumatic injury, the first thing that nurses are going to do is cut your clothes off. Those are from Mr. Pitts. By Cameron Pitts, it's all red in color. And the clothing worn by Mr. John Doe is all blue. Red and blue. It smells like a crimson blood stain. It sure does. At this time in Colorado Springs, there are two predominant gangs, the Crips and the Bloods. Crips usually identified by wearing blue. Bloods usually identified by wearing red. Uh, and you didn't wear the other person's color. That was a big part of the problem back then. So now we know that this is a Crip and Blood affair, and they're not friends, they are enemies. And the clothing says that loud and clear. Apparently the witness we spoke to wasn't telling us the truth. Looks that way. So my concern about Fitz Bannister's story has now come full circle. There is a Crip and a Blood and maybe somebody else but it's not two white guys. Kenda suspects the two victims struggled over a gun and both got shot. But which man pulled the weapon first? Right now, I think the smartest thing to do is get a GSR and test on both our victims. Absolutely. We always perform gun residue tests on everyone involved in a shooting, including the victims, to determine if they fired a weapon in their recent past. Well, Mr. Pitts is being prepped for surgery, but I can take you to the victim. Thank you. While surgeons are patching up Cameron Pitt's abdomen, police focus on the unidentified victim. Looks like this guy got roughed up pretty good. This person with the gunshot wound to the head is thought to be at death's door. He has blunt trauma to the face. He's been punched by somebody recently and very hard. Hey, detectives. We should reach out to the corner. We need an autopsy on this guy as soon as he passes. Yeah, I'll make sure he's notified. Yeah, we should also snap a couple pictures of him. Maybe one of the guys in our gang will recognize him. Mm, good idea. Doc, do you mind? No. Who are you? Now, let's make sure that happens as well. Yes, sir. So we have gang specialists on the police department who spend their time identifying these members, talking with them, in contact with them all the time to try to keep track of what gang group they belong to. Recognize this guy? Yeah, I think I know him. Um, he's a crip. Goes by the street name Baby Lock. His real name is uh, Eddie Jones. Uh, I recognize the tattoos. It's definitely him. We asked, does he carry a gun? And the gang officer says, that son of a bitch always has a gun. Any idea what type of gun he prefers? Every time I talk to him, he's got a 9mm. Well, guess what's in that hallway? The 9mm handgun. We're investigating a shooting involving a 19-year-old named Cameron Pitts blood affiliate who's in surgery and we also have mr eddie jones who is a known crip and eddie is no longer with us based on our victims records we were able to identify that he has a mother who lives in georgia hello miss jones in this particular case we have to notify her by phone which is very hard to do it's kind of a gut-wrenching thing to have to sit there and tell somebody that their son is dead <laughs> i'm very sorry for your loss no! It's like every parent's nightmare, talking to somebody you don't even know, he's telling you this horrible news about your son. As soon as Eddie Jones submits to his injuries, Cameron Pitts overcomes his. Now it's our chance to go talk to him. We know he was there. He's the one person who should be able to tell us exactly what happened. But that's easier said than done. It ain't much to say. I mean, me and Eddie, we exchanged a few words the other day playing ball. Seen each other last night. Things got out of control. Cameron, please stop. Just stop, all right? You're a blood. He's a crip. You hate each other. Don't bore me with a basketball story. You need to tell us what happened. Now. Because we're not leaving until we figure this out. 
All right, look, man. Been beefing for a while now. He says, well, some time ago, he was near the bus station downtown. Oh, hell, you know, it's that bubble gun. All right, man, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. Yo, son, you're going to have to get up off my block. And Eddie Jones pulled up in a car and started yelling at him. Man, what? Dude, you trip. Move along. And it's gang posturing back and forth about who hates who and so on. You were ran on my block. Gonna have to step. Then what's up? Oh, it's like that? Damn right it is. All right. I'm gonna see you. For so. I left. And that was it. I ain't seen him since. Till last night. What happened last night? I was at my homeboy's apartment. Stepped out to have a smoke. And I was there. Oh, it's this bitch again. I thought I told you to watch yourself. Man, what the hell? These my streets. What's up? <laughs> Cameron says that Eddie immediately comes up to him and punches him in the face. In the course of that fight, Eddie Jones pulls a gun out of his waistband and shoots Cameron twice in the stomach. Well, man, I was just trying to get the gun away from him because I was worried he's going to shoot me again. While we was fighting, the thing just went off. So he shot him with his own gun? No. I ain't pulling no trigger. Just went off. Cameron is very vague about how this transpired and is obviously, in my opinion, lying about what happened here. So you're saying that cold cocked in the face? Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about there are any injuries on your face. No reddening of the skin, no swelling, no indication he's been punched by anybody. Man, I don't know. Dude don't pack that much of a punch. Right. And the camera's just looking at me because he knows he's lying. I know he's lying, but here we are. He's the victim, and he's still lying. Yeah. Got him in hand. The hell are you doing? We're gonna find out if you pulled the trigger on that gun or not. Not telling the whole truth about a gunshot residue test, because the reality is. If he's within close contact with a gun at the time it's discharged, he's going to have this stuff on his hands. Can I have your other hand? But we want him to think that it's going to prove that he fired the weapon. Uh, put a little pressure on him, hopefully get a better statement out of him. So what happens now? So what happens now is we're going to take those swabs to the lab. We'll have the results soon enough. Then we're going to swing back around and visit you. Sound good? I ain't pulling no trigger, so I don't matter. We'll see about that. The imagination of humans will race when you tell them something. You see the wheels begin to turn and just leave them with that thought and let them agonize. And when they agonize, they suffer from diarrhea of the mouth the next time you talk to them. While Cameron Pitts is left to stew, Kenda checks in on the autopsy of Eddie Jones. Hey man, what'd you find, eh? We'll take a look at this entry one. The autopsy tells us something really significant. The gunshot wound that kills Eddie Jones is to the back of his head. It is in a range of one to two inches away. It's an execution shot. It's not an accidental upward moving bullet from a struggling gun. I think we need to talk to Mr. Pitts again. Suspect number one in the murder of Eddie Jones. Cameron, we're back. Didn't take long, did it? Well, you're very confident when you go back to see Cameron because you know a lot more than you knew when the last time you talked to him. So we're going to screw with him. We got some test results back. We don't think you're going to like what we found out. I'm going to be honest, Cameron. I think you're lying through your teeth. I say, of all the stories I've heard in a long time, it's not the worst one, but it's in the top five. And I look at that heart monitor, his heart's gone like a piston because he's scared to death. I need you to tell us the truth right here, right now. Otherwise, you're going down for a murder rap, you understand? And a heart rate's going to 160. That's pretty serious. I said, Cameron, your heart's about to jump out of your chest. You notice that? Why do you think that is? All right, look, man. When I told 
you about the struggle with the gun, that was true. What? A what? But there was another guy there. He had his hands on the gun, too. He the one shot at it. What's his name? My homeboy. Fitz. Fitz Benson. Fitz Bannister, now where have we heard that name before? Mr. Eyewitness, who sees the bad guys run away. Well, thank you, Cameron. It can be very helpful. We're investigating a shooting which has turned out to be a gang confrontation between two individuals. But now we're in a position to know that there was a third person in the hallway when that shooting took place. And we know who that is. Have a seat, Mr. Bannister. Remember us? Yes, sir. We have something that's to our advantage. Fitz Bannister doesn't have a record. He has no experience with the police. He's frightened. And that's a good thing. So Fitz... Those two white guys you said you saw running away? We know that was a lie. I said, we just talked to Cameron, and he said some really interesting things about you. He said you were there, and you were fighting over that gun. Wait, what? So you're really telling us the truth? Okay, look. I saw what happened. Cameron came over to jail. He says Cameron went out to smoke a cigarette. A little bit later, he heard a knock on the door. He's thinking, oh, well, Cameron locked himself out. This is 12-year-old kid. Is my friend Marlon in here? No, there's no Marlon that lives here. We got the wrong place. So who's the kid? I don't know his name. Fitz says he's talking to this kid, and he hears arguing in the hall. He says he sees Eddie Jones punch Cameron in the face. Well, Fitz says that when he goes to break up the fight, Eddie pulls a gun out of his waistband and shoots Cameron twice in the stomach. Fitz says the gun goes off and Eddie Jones falls down. Really, Fitz? You expect us to believe that? We saw Cameron. He didn't have any marks on his face. I mean, I swear to God, I didn't shoot nobody. God, I didn't shoot nobody, okay? He put his head down on the table like he was crying. Then he suddenly looked up at me to see what my reaction was, and there are no tears in his eyes. He goes back to simulating crying again. I said, Fitz, when you apply for an Oscar, people review your performance. I gotta tell you, you're not gonna get an Oscar. Nice try, Fitz. Will you stop being a little kid for a few minutes? Because I'm going to treat you like an adult. And I'm going to put you in adult prison with other adults that you're not going to like at all. I'm telling the truth. It's all crap. We know it's crap. Any detective been on or any officer has been on more than a year, he's seen these bogus statements and bogus crime individuals. So we're not buying it. Hey, admit you're with the Bloods just like your boy Cameron. I'm not. Look, man, I hang out with those guys sometimes, but I'm not no gangbanger. I told you I was there, and I had my hand on the gun, but... Keep going. Nothing, man. I... I want my lawyer. That's probably a good idea, Fitz, because you're going to need one. Go ahead and come and get him out of here. Stand up. I didn't do nothing. I didn't do nothing. Now we're in a situation where I don't really have anything that says if it's Fitz that did it or if it's Cameron who did it. You can still move after you've been shot in the stomach. It hurts, but if you can hold up under the pain, you can still move around quite a bit. So we're sitting there trying to think what to do now. What's going to resolve this? The players aren't going to resolve it. So we go back through this report. It's always best to start over. You just start over. Hey, here's something. One of the patrol officers spoke with a 12-year-old kid named Stephen Lane at the apartment complex. Didn't Fitz say something about a kid being at his door right before the shooting? Yeah, exactly. Doesn't look like they got much. His mom cut the interview off. Probably afraid of gang retribution. But it might be worth another shot with this kid. Good call. I'll head over there now. So we knock on the door, and Mrs. Lane, it doesn't seem 
some surprise to see us. Yeah, I thought you might be back. Steven, someone's here to see you. Hi, Steven, I'm Joe. We have to get his trust, make him feel very comfortable around us. So we're in. Seven. You sit down with him so you're the same height. You don't want to be standing over a 12-year-old kid, uh, looming over him in some threatening manner. Can you play any sports? Yeah, basketball. You want to just let him settle a little bit and find out about him. So you can see it in his body language, that he's relaxing. Buddy, the reason I'm here is that something bad happened in the complex the other night. And your mom thinks you might know something about it. Yeah, I was in the hallway. Can you tell me what you saw? Yeah, I went to go see my friend. I thought he lived on the third floor, but there was a sky out there. He sees a guy all dressed in red, smoking a cigarette in the hallway. While I was sitting there, this dude dressed in blue came down the hallway. Oh, is this bitch again? Man, what the hell? And the two of them, like, started yelling at each other. Now you in my home? What's up, then? Oh, then, what's up? Do something, bitch! But Steven says that Cameron initiates it by assaulting Eddie in the mouth, which the autopsy supports. So that's probably true. And then the third guy comes in the apartment to help. <laughs> Stephen tells us that he sees Eddie shoot Cameron twice. He immediately joins in on the fight. Fitz and Eddie are still fighting over the gun, and Fitz gets control of it and takes it away from Eddie. Eddie turns to head for the staircase, and Fitz shoots him in the head. And then Fitz tries to wipe his prints off the gun and drops it next to Eddie's hand. Stephen Lane is telling us what we expected that did happen, and now we have an eyewitness to it that that is what happened. I ran home as fast as I could. Stephen, why don't you tell me the truth? Thank you. After hearing Stephen's story, Kenda feels confident charging both Cameron and Fitz in the deadly altercation. Cameron was only charged with third-degree assault because he beat up Eddie. And he also agreed to testify against his friend Fitz. And eventually, because he did cooperate, those charges against him were dropped. Fitz was subsequently charged with second-degree murder. Through plea negotiation that was reduced down to reckless manslaughter, which he pled guilty to, he was subsequently sentenced to six years for that charge. This particular case is an illustration of what it's like when young people who affiliate with street gangs encounter each other and there is a history of violence between them. Two ships passing in the night that recognize each other and make a turn. And that's when gunfire can happen. After a frozen body turns up on a remote mountain road, Lieutenant Kenda makes a startling discovery. You got a mother and an adult daughter, both reported missing by their respective husbands. Well, now we know it's even more complicated than we thought. <laughs> to find out what happened, investigators will have to untangle an intricate web of family secrets. Was she having an affair and her mother was covering for her? He was always concerned to me during this entire investigation. Well, that makes you a little more interesting than you were five minutes ago. As police officers, you discover and see many terrible things. There are some of those things that are so awful and so beyond the pale that they burn their image into your brain and you never forget. There's one thing that...
that never changes. Murder. A life has been taken. Their stories are now my stories. I never know where a case is going to lead, but I'll never stop until it's solved. Somebody has to look out for the victim. If you kill, I will find you. It's a bright February afternoon. Ronald and Tara Keller are making their way towards Kingston Circle, a remote area in Teller County, Colorado. How much farther till we get there? Should be close. They wanted to go check out some property south of a little town called Divide, and it's high, it's way up in the mountains. Wow. So beautiful up here. Yeah, and deserted too. I haven't seen another car in over an hour. And so they're going down this road. That's weird. And they saw a car. So they stopped. Do you think someone else came to look at the property? Maybe. I wasn't expecting to get into a bidding war out here. <laughs> and got out and approached the car. Oh, I should have brought another coat. And at that altitude, February is freezing. The car looks abandoned, doesn't it? Maybe they're up here checking out the land. Wait, what's that? Where? That. They thought they saw something that didn't look right. And then as they got closer still, it appeared to be a human. Oh, jeez, she's dead. Oh, my God. Paso District Attorney Investigators Larry Martin and Mark Coors are relaxing after a long week of work. Mark and I lived together probably no more than five or six months at, at the max, and it, it was a good living arrangement. You got any plans tomorrow? Thought maybe I'd take it easy, drink a few beers. I had just started probably a month before this particular case as an investigator for the El Paso County DA's office. Hey, you deserve it after the week we put you through. <laughs> Larry Martin was not only a good friend of mine, but Larry was also my mentor. Hello, this is Martin. Really? Way up there? Teller County reports that they have found the body of a deceased female off a mountain highway in the middle of nowhere. Well, right away, it threw up a red flag. We could be looking at a homicide here. I'll put a team together and we'll be up there as soon as possible. Cancel your plans. I'm sure it was just very convenient for Larry to look over at me and say, we got to go to work. Located just beyond Colorado's majestic Pikes Peak, it takes Martin and Gore over an hour to make it to the crime scene. There's no gas station businesses of any kind. There's no place to go and no reason to go there. Hey, Larry. Man, it's a cold one tonight. You're telling me. It's dark as hell up here. Yeah, when I first arrived on scene, I was contacted by the undersheriff of the Teller County Sheriff's Department. Uh, this is Mark Kors. He's new to our team. Howdy. Good to have you. He tells them that they have found the body of a middle-aged white female face down on the ground, 40 yards off of the highway. Is that a victim's car? Awesome. We're pulling a name off the plates right now to say it belongs to. And at that time, it was suspected that the car and the body were somehow connected. The coroner's on his way up here, so we haven't touched anything yet. All right, well, let's take a look at our Jane Doe. So I was taken over and shown where the body had been found. There she is. Where's her coat? Yeah, strange, huh? From our initial observance, there didn't appear to be any blood evidence visible. No idea on it. It just looked very suspicious that something occurred to cause this lady to go down. Looks like she's been here at least a few days. Yeah, pretty mortis to sit in. Riger mortis, it passes relatively quickly, a day or two, but being it's winter time, perhaps the body is frozen on scene and gets to work. 
The nice thing about the cold weather is that it's like putting a body in a cooler. It can preserve the body, and so it's not as decomposed as it would be if it was laying in the heat. Let's gently flip her. He uh, examined the body. And he, too, indicated that he found no other signs of trauma to the body. So there's nothing obvious? Without an autopsy, I can't give you a cause of death. Okay. Uh, Let's go see what else we can dig up. Got it. Thanks, Doc. I wanted to look around the area to see, you know, what evidence of any was there, uh, but it was dark. You could step off a cliff and fall a thousand feet to your death and not realize it's happening until it's too late. We gotta wait till morning. Let's go on ahead and tape off this whole area. We'll set up a team to come up at first light and see if we can find any physical evidence. Copy that. Thanks. So what next? Well, it's one thing we can look into. Maybe that car can give us some idea of who this particular person is and what may have happened to her. All the doors are locked. And no keys are found around the car or around this body that was discovered. So where are the keys for this car? No one knows. But we were able to notice that there was a purse sitting on the front seat. Excuse me, detectives. Got a hit on that plate. The car registers to a Madeline Proctor, who is 54 years old. Let's call it for a search warrant. Morning. We've got a lot of legal precautions because we still don't know exactly who the owner is and if they might actually be the suspect in the case. Within the hour, investigators get the green light to search the vehicle. It stinks. Right away, we smell a distinct odor of, of stale alcohol. And there are four empty wine cooler bottles on the back seat, and they're still got some little bit of liquid in the base. There's no damage to the car. They didn't crash land here. And it's got a full tank of gas. So why did they pull over here? So you're wondering, was she running away from someone? <laughs> she could have been running for her life. Or did she trip and fall down? I don't know. But for now... We're going to assume this is an intentional act. Think that's our Jane Doe? They find a Colorado driver's license in the name of Madeline Proctor, the registered owner of the car. It's definitely her. Her address is listed in Colorado Springs. Why is this person on this remote mountain road 70 miles from home? I think I know somebody who can help us with this. It was obvious that we needed to call the Color Springs Police Department, ask for some assistance. It's kind of... Hey, Joe, it's Larry. You got a minute? Of course. What's going on? I need you to run a name for me. Sure. What's the name? Uh, Madeline Proctor. So I said, this is the lady we found on the side of the road. All right, hang on a second. Let me see if I can find him dead a bit. Larry and I have worked together and known each other for 30 years. We commonly worked murders together and separately. So in my computer, I determined that Madeline Proctor was listed as a missing person. And I think I got a file on her. Hang on a second. Sure, take your time. I looked up the report, which I kept in my office. Now, this is interesting. Uh, she's reported missing five days ago by her husband, Bob. Really? Oh, wow. What's that? So I tell Larry, I said, there's another complication here. I see a connected report. Uh, Madeline's daughter, Elizabeth Barnes, was reported missing by her husband five days ago as well. Uh, 26 years old, uh, enrolled in the nursing program. You got a mother and an adult daughter, both reported missing by their respective husbands five days prior to this body being found. Well, that's odd. We didn't find a trace of her up here at the crime scene. Now we know it's even more complicated than we thought. Where is Elizabeth Barnes? We're 
investigating the death of 54-year-old Madeline Proctor in Teller County. I've discovered two missing persons reports that are connected, one involving Mrs. Proctor and the other involving her daughter, Elizabeth Barnes. We don't know where Elizabeth Barnes is or how they both came to be missing at the same time. Well, once we find out that Bob Proctor, the husband of Madeline, had filed his missing personal Well, when we first contacted Bob, Hello? we let him know that we were there in relation to the missing person report he filed. Did you find her and Liz? Are they okay? I think we should discuss this inside. And you can see it in Bob's face. Yeah, okay. Which in some ways is good for him. No prior knowledge. Oh, you can just move that stuff anywhere. I haven't been able to keep up on cleaning since Madeline disappeared. It's okay. He is distressed before we say a word. So how long have you two been married? See, so we got divorced about 10 years ago, but we still live together. You guys must think that's a little weird, right? Well, that makes you a little more interesting than you were five minutes ago. I mean, I guess it just works for us. You said that after the divorce, Madeline actually joined the Peace Corps and went to Africa for several years. I needed some help with the bills, so I got a roommate. She works a lot. She's never around much. And what's her name? Hannah Thompson. Anyway, things got complicated once Madeline got sick. Bob says Mrs. Proctor contracted the disease malaria, which is very common in Africa, and she became extremely ill to the point of nearly dying. So I bought her a plane ticket home and moved her into the spare bedroom. He was not romantically involved with her, but he still cared about her. And he felt it was his obligation to take care of her in her time of need. Can I get you another blanket? No, no, I'm fine. This tea's perfect. And how has that been, living together? We've got a pretty good thing going. Hey, Dad. Hey. Hey, Mom. How you feeling? I'm still tired, but your dad's been taking great care of me. Good. Madeline and Elizabeth, her daughter, were very close. Liz, can I get you anything? Iced tea? Oh, no, I'm good. Thank you. And one of the benefits for Bob of having Madeline in his house was that it meant Elizabeth was around more. He told us that she had gotten over the malaria and she would be moving back out of the house. So what can you tell me? Has anyone spoken with them? It's been my experience and Martin's experience as well. When you do this, don't beat around the bush. We're very sorry to inform you that your wife, Madeline Proctor, is no longer alive. I'm very sorry. And what about my Liz? She's still missing. He is devastated by this news. He was hopeful we were going to tell him she's fine. She's not fine. And can you walk us through what you remember from the day that they disappeared? Liz came by to pick up her mother. Hey, sweetheart. Hey. What are you doing here? I'm just here to pick up mom, so I can't stay long. Mom, you ready? I just need two minutes. Where are you headed? Oh, just the library. They said they were going to go to UCCS, which is the University of Colorado, and work on a project they were involved in in the library. See you later, Bob. Bye, Dad. Love you. Okay, be safe. I will. So they took off together, theoretically, to do that. And they never returned. When Madeline didn't come home, I figured she just stayed at Liz's. Then Bob says that the next morning, early, Mike Barnes, who is Elizabeth Barnes' husband, came barging in Bob's door in a panic and said, hey, she didn't come home. But we called the police. You know, Liz's dog is missing, too. Oh, yeah. Badger. She loves that little guy. Takes him everywhere. So now we have two women and a dog that are missing. This adds up to what? Well, kidnapping? Assault? Murder? Who knows? All options are on the table. Mike probably won't shed a tear over Madeline. 
And he mentions that Mike Barnes, who is Elizabeth Barnes' husband, really dislikes Madeline because he believes his wife is too close to her and that that closeness interferes with his marriage. But Bob says that to raise an eyebrow. What if Mike decides that he's tired of Madeline and Madeline needs to go into the ground? That's an entirely reasonable possibility. We found some wine coolers in their car. What? Did they like to drink together? No way. He said that we're both relatively straight and sober all the time, and he didn't have any reason to believe at all that they would be out drinking. And Madeline's vision is so bad, she can't even drive. There's no way she could make it up there in the mountains alone. So if anybody was driving that car, it would have been his daughter, Elizabeth. Please, you have to find my Liz. I promise you, we'll do everything we can to find her. Again, I'm very sorry. At this particular point in the investigation, I think it's important that we go back to where Madeline was found and do a thorough search. Is Liz somewhere on that mountain? We're going to need some help out there. All right. I'll get a team together. To search in a grid pattern. So it's very organized. It has to be. You can't just wander around and expect to find anything. You have to methodically search. You got a picture of this terrain that we're dealing with here. It's very heavily wooded. Even in broad daylight, you can become disoriented in five minutes. So they've moved out about a hundred yards from the car, and we're not finding anything. Here we go. We start hearing a little yip. This way. You hear that? It's not very good either. As we get closer, it's obvious there's a, a human body laying on the ground. And on the chest of this body is this little dog. Looks like she's been here at least a few days. Holy sh Something was feeding on the face of the victim. It is a horrifying vision that many people have never seen, and they're very distressed by that. We may have found our missing daughter.
day, the coroner updates the team. In all honesty, there's not very much I can tell you at this point. He examined the body, and he found no other signs of trauma to the body other than what was obvious to this body's face. And said the damage was post-mortem, after death, carnivore involvement, i.e. the dog. I did find this, though. He finds the driver's license in the pocket of the jacket of this woman, and it's Elizabeth Barnes. you know how long she's been deceased? I'd say probably seven days or so. That corresponds with the date they were both reported missing. We'll have to wait for the autopsy to determine the cause of death. All right, thank you. Good luck. After the victim's body is removed, CSPD's crime lab is given the green light to process the scene. Now, they've got some pretty good equipment that they set up and they take measurements, uh, they take GPS locations so that later we can reconstruct the scene as we see it right at that particular moment. Right over there. He sees something twinkle in the dirt and reaches down and determines there are a set of car keys. So if Liz Barnes had the keys to the car, why would she take them with her up into the hills? What if she was attacked and she was running for her life? At this point, anything is possible. So after they conduct that search of those footprints, they report to Martin. Martin, team's finishing up right now, but uh, we're pretty confident in our findings. And what's that? And they tell Martin that those are all belonging to Elizabeth Barnes. Every single print is hers. She had fallen down several times. She was walking in multiple directions. It was obvious that there was only one person up on that mountain. The footprints told them that uh, this person appeared to be disorientated. At some point in time, she, uh, she was crossing over safe tracks over and over again. No, why would she do that? So the mystery... Dr. Mike Barnes. He's still a viable suspect in this investigation. Did she initially run from her husband? And then once got up in this particular area, couldn't find her way back out? Right, let me know if you need anything. I'm going to head back to the station. All right, sounds good. Down. Uh, please have a seat. Okay. Mike was certainly somebody we wanted to pay attention to in case he might have some criminal involvement in this. I heard about Madeline. Did you find my wife? <clears throat> I'm sorry to have to tell you this. She's dead? We told him, yes, that we had found Liz and that we had found her deceased in the same general area as we had found Madeline. Barnes's reaction is somewhat bizarre. He's nervous and fidgety and his body language is odd. I'm sorry, I just need a minute. It's okay, take your time. Are you acting oddly just because you're odd or are you acting that way because you killed her? So, now what? We just need to ask you a few questions. Seriously? We had to ask him about his relationship with uh, his mother-in-law, Madeline. And uh, we told him we had information that there was some bad blood between the two of them. It's not that I didn't like her. She was just always around, putting a strain on our marriage. Can you tell us where you were the day that she disappeared? Yeah, I was at work. You can call them and check. Do you mind? Sure. Excuse me for a moment. Mike was always concerning to me during this entire investigation because his demeanor was just not consistent with how I would expect a reasonable person to act. Checks out? Except for the fact that he had a clear alibi. We could verify through his employer that he had been at work. I never wish any harm on Madeline. We just weren't close. And if I'm being honest, I always thought she was a bad influence on my wife. Well, what do you mean by that? It was very strange. I mean, the mom was 54 years old. The daughter was 26. That's not really your pattern for being a bad influence. Like, for example, the last time I saw Liz, she was all... Nice. Thanks. Thought you said you were
you're going to school. Character for his wife to have her hair and makeup done on a general basis, but particularly because she was just saying she was going down to the school library with her mother. What can you tell us about Liz's school schedule? Michael said that he's well aware of her activities at school, and she had a mentor named Pete Gosher, who she spent a lot of time with in the library. They usually met once a week throughout the semester. You don't think he might have had something to do with this, do you? He said even though he knew that she was going to the college with her mother, that he felt that she was probably going to meet up with Pete. Was she having an affair and her mother was covering for her? There was another strange element to the whole thing. You definitely want him to account for his whereabouts when they went missing. What was going on with him and her at that time? So now we have a new name. Who is Pete Gosher, and what does he have to do with this disappearance and death of these two women? We don't know the answer to that, but we need to find out. We're investigating the mysterious deaths of 54-year-old Madeline Proctor and her daughter, 26-year-old Elizabeth Barnes. We have uncovered a new person of interest. His name is Pete Gosher, who may have had an arrangement to meet with Elizabeth Barnes on the day she disappeared. Well, now at this point, we want to go talk to people at the college. Did he meet with Liz? And if so, what was the conversation? Hi, I'm Detective Martin. This is Detective Coors. So they asked her if she remembered seeing Elizabeth Barnes or Madeline Proctor on Friday the 18th. No, I don't think so, but I mean, that was a while ago. Do you have a sign-in sheet that I could see just to be sure? Here it is. Great, thank you. Martin checked those sign-in logs for the date of disappearance and found nothing. So the likelihood is great that she was never there. What about a Pete Gosher? Oh, yeah. He's right there. Sure, we'd love to talk to him, so... We went over and introduced ourselves. Excuse me. Are you Pete? Yeah. What can I help you with? Do you know Madeline Proctor and Liz Barnes? Well, sure, I know Liz. He said we're in the same class together, and we work together in the library on projects that are connected to that class. I would call us study buddies. Fridays are our usual study days. But... I feel like she's been blowing school off. Well, I hung around for an hour, but she never showed up. And uh, she never called him to tell him that she wasn't showing up, so he was a little put off by that. So you wonder, is he that good of a liar, or just doesn't he know that she's gone? Sorry to have to tell you this, but we found the bodies of Liz and her mother up in Teller County. What? You mean Liz is dead? I'm afraid so. We need to know what kind of relationship you and Liz had. Excuse me? He is generally shocked and insists that it was only a study relationship. The Friday they disappeared, you were supposed to meet with her. Can you recall what you were doing that day? Yeah. After the library, I went to a lecture. And we were able to verify the fact that he was at that lecture. So he's ruled out as, as anybody involved in the disappearance of these two ladies. With little to go on, Martin checks in with Kenda at the station. We're going nowhere fast with this one. So what do we know so far? Well, we can eliminate the school, that's for sure. What if they never planned to go to school that day? What if they lie to their family? That's an interesting thought. Let's take a look at the map. What were they going to, and why are there wine coolers in that car? Let's see. It's where their house is, right about there. It's only a few miles from where they resided to the University of Colorado. And they came up 24. And yet when they're dead, they're 70 miles plus from where they live. I think I know where they were headed. My thought at that point is it's pretty obvious then that they were headed to Cripple Creek. They probably missed the turn at Divide 
got lost. I would explain why they're all dressed up. If you're looking for a place for entertainment when you go west out of Colorado Springs, Cripple Creek is going to be the best destination because of the casinos and the limited stakes gambling. And, of course, every casino serves lots of alcohol, and it's free, so it's a very easy place to go to if that's your intention. Maybe Liz and Madeline were trying to sneak away for a little bit of fun at the casino and never made it. Could that be? Yes. Could they have met somebody in Cripple Creek and things went south? Yeah, they could have done that, too. Skanda. I get a call, and it's the coroner's office. He said the autopsy explanations are complete. Oh, good news. The coroner's determined to call. This case, if someone murdered Madeline Proctor and her daughter, Elizabeth Barnes, how did they do that? By what means did they cause their death? Hey, Doc. Hey, Detectives. Thanks for coming down so quickly. So what do we know? Well, I have to say, this is a really strange case. There was no outward signs of trauma to either body, other than the dog eating part of the face of Liz. So there's no bruising, there's no punctures, there's no hypodermic marks, there's no gunshot wounds, there's no stab wounds. Something had to kill him. And so we're left wondering what happened to these women. Sometimes the answer lies in the toxicology findings. The tox screen came back with a mild level of alcohol. But more importantly, there's a high dose of something else in their system. Really? What could that be? Are we dealing with two people who are drugged? It's certainly starting to look that way. At long last, we are finally closer to discovering what happened to Madeline Proctor and Elizabeth Barnes. Two women who were found dead up in the mountains outside their car. With their autopsies now showing signs of some abnormality, we must now figure out exactly what we're dealing with here. What was in the toxicology report? Have you heard of the new medication Zoloft? Zoloft is an antidepressant known as the Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. And in 1994, this is still a pretty new medication. Doctors are starting to prescribe it to help combat depression. And physicians know as much as we know now about the medication. So could they have overdosed on it? Based on the talk screen, I, I don't think so, but it could have altered their mindset. For these women to combine it with alcohol and then to go up into the mountains and have the change of elevation can really cause some concerning side effects. Even the coroner says that that would likely cause disorientation and confusion. Well, how they get their hands on it? Our uh, investigation showed that there was no Zoloft prescribed to either of the two of them. So then we became concerned about where did it come from? Could it be in the Proctor home? Police return to the house and find ex-husband Bob Proctor and roommate Hannah Thompson home. Both give permission to search the property. It's all about the reasonableness of your search, particularly under consent. You don't want to destroy somebody's home. You want to be very careful. Bingo. But these antidepressants were prescribed to Bob's roommate. The discovery of that bottle with her name on it, Hannah Thompson makes her a potential player in this event. What can you tell us about these? So when Martin produces this bottle of antidepressant, Hannah's face drops. Oh, where did you get this? Uh, from your medicine cabinet. She admitted that she'd been having some problems with depression and had gone to the doctor he had prescribed these for. Have you ever given any pills to Liz or Madeline? No, of course not, but... Anna says, you know, I've noticed for some time now that there are some pills missing from these bottles. I suspected Madeline had been stealing my pills. Why would Madeline Proctor steal these drugs? And why would she give them to her daughter? We'll never have that answer. But taking those medications on top of making those wine coolers and driving up to the mountains apparently caused a problem with both of them. Later that week, 
the coroner makes his final ruling on the case. Well, there you have it. The ruling of the death was accidental. You're kidding. Primary cause, exposure. Secondary cause, hypothermia. You know, working a case like this, you want to come to a conclusion. We'll never have all the answers that we want, and that's sad. While no one will ever know what really happened to Madeline and her daughter Elizabeth, Kenda and Martin have a theory. It's obvious that the two ladies had a plan that evening. They were going to go out. See you later, Bob. Have some fun. Okay, be safe. I will. They are lying about where they're going and lying about what they're going to do. I can't believe they bought it. Right, Badger? <laughs> And for whatever reason, through habit, through oversight, Badger came along. Viva Cripple Creek. This probably wasn't the first time they've gone out without telling anyone. This is delicious. I got something else for you, too. Ooh, what is it? Just a little something to take the edge off. Here. Thank you. Madeline, at some point, introduces the antidepressants to her daughter. What is her motivation? The only one who knows is Madeline, and she can't tell us. I cannot wait to hit the craps table tonight. If I win big, I can get my own apartment. I'm so tired of having roommates. And then I can visit you all the time. Yeah, I'm fine. The elevation approaching Coomer Creek is in excess of 9,000 feet above sea level. Alcohol impact increases with altitude. Do you know where you're going? Mind your own damn business. Then mix in some antidepressants. And we have two very confused and very disoriented women. Maybe we should pull over and check the map. I said I know where I'm going. I think easily there could have been an argument in the car. God knows it's not that unusual for parents and children to have fights over how the child is driving. Would you shut up? Mom, can you just stop? He probably has to go to the bathroom or something. For whatever reason, they consciously stop the car. Why are you pulling over here? There's nothing for miles. Where else am I supposed to pull over? Okay. Okay. Just be careful. Watch out for wild animals. Yeah, okay, Mom. It was obvious to us that Liz was probably the first one to leave the car. She gets out of the car. She's still got the car keys with her. And she's got her dog with her. Let's go. she gets out of the car. Liz! Where are you? Elizabeth! Damn it! When Madeline got out of the car, the door locked behind her and she had no way to get back in because her daughter had the keys. And so then she's out in very cold weather and probably in a panic state herself wondering where her daughter is. Elizabeth has no idea how to get back to the car and her mother. She gets disoriented. It's gonna be okay. You can get turned around in a hurry and not even remember where you came from. event is that poor dog and he had to do the unthinkable to his owner out of desperation 
<laughs> the daughter was in nurses training. The mom had been in the Peace Corps. And to lose them to a bizarre situation like this seems like really kind of a loss for everybody. As far as we're concerned, case closed accidental deaths. That case will never be closed for Bob and Mike. They'll live with this for the rest of their lives, wondering what happened and why did it happen. It's a tragic thing indeed that mother and daughter devoted to each other decide that they're going to go out for the magic night out that turns into the ultimate horrific nightmare. They had no way of knowing when they walked out that door. They never walked out. Were advised that 
the girlfriend was very distraught, so they escorted her from the scene to the police station to be interviewed later. Okay, hold on to the now witnessing so we take a look at the body. Yes, sir. So I walk up to this car and sitting behind the wheel, slumped over in the seat to his right, is Ricky Nelson. His chest is covered in blood. Did you see the tire iron? Yep. Your first conclusion when look at this, there are four tires inflated on this car. He has no reason to have this tire iron in or near him. It may mean nothing at all, but it's interesting that it's there. Got a bunch of casings over here. There's eight shell casings found at the scene. The shell casings are small caliber 22. Also, we noticed that the victim's vehicle has some damage to include seven bullet holes. of an unqualified shooter, somebody that really doesn't know how to use the gun, just pulls the trigger until it stops going bang and points this in the direction of the victim. Okay, witness? Yes, sir. So we've looked at this crime scene, and now the patrol officers have a witness present in the back of a patrol car whose name is Walter Walker. Chef C. So you're friends with Mr. Nelson? Yeah, me and Ricky, we go way back. He goes by the street of Scappy. He tells us that they've known each other since they were children, and it's clear to us that he's very upset over the loss of Ricky. So what went out here tonight? Uh, I, I don't know. We was driving around, and I got out in the car to pee, and these two dudes showed up. He says two males approach him, and they talk. He doesn't say about what. And they're in some blue car, and all of a sudden it goes way south, and everything goes down. I, I, I don't know. It just got control real fast. Those boys were crazy. He gives us a physical description, which is relatively vague. Here's the thing, Mr. Walker. You want us to find who you killed your friend? We're going to need some more information. I told you it was a blue car, right? Listen, we know you're not telling us everything. I got a pretty good idea why. This particular murder occurred in front of a house that has a history with the police department. It's known to be a crack house. All right, you're ready to go. But I want you to think about everything that happened here tonight. Do you remember any names or details? Give me a call. Yes, sir. You got it. Scappy is not chargeable with an offense. It's not against the law to drive around at 2 o'clock in the morning. He is a witness. Nothing more, nothing less. Think he'll drop your line once he gets his head straight? That's unlikely. Why don't we pay a visit to the house next door? Crack house? Hard to get a warrant this time of night. Now we don't need a warrant to knock on the door and ask a few questions. True. Worth a shot. We don't know exactly why those shots were fired, so all options are on the table. the individual we recognize him from prior drug raids and that can be to our advantage if they know we're not after them they'll share information we're investigating a shooting you know anything about that i heard some gunshots that's it come on Smitty. it's getting late we don't have time to play games uh, he kind of shrugs his shoulders well i heard somebody was honking their horn really incessantly and there was a disturbance and a bunch of yelling I seen his blue car <laughs> Damn well they was up to. What was that? They were selling dope. Duh. <laughs> I heard them get off my street and go sell somewhere else. And I told them people here, here, only be buying from me. The response back, according to Smitty, was these individuals told him. I went back in the house. Nobody wants to talk to the police. And the way to avoid that is not see. Ricky then returned back to his car. 
touches his chest, sees the blood, and he dies. Please help my mom and my boyfriend. She looked at me in my eyes and said, always remember two things. First, to always take care of yourself. And the second is that I love you very much. Ricky's head went back like this, and it was gone. I had to protect myself. I swear I didn't have any choice, man. Wade Douglas admits that he shot Ricky Nelson, and he said he did so because Mr. Nelson was armed with a tire iron and was advancing toward him aggressively, and he shot him as a result. Now I thought I'd guys. I fucked the prosecutors. Go ahead and cop them. Come on, man. What are you talking about? Stand up. Is it right? Is it right, man? It's Wade was initially charged with secondary murder. During the trial, he was subsequently acquitted by the jury who felt that he clearly had the right to protect himself and that Ricky was a threat with a tire iron. Albert, even though initially involved in the fight, he was not involved directly in the shooting. He was not charged with any wrongdoing. He really was the love of my life. I'd be happily married now if he wasn't gone. Every day, I live with the memory of what was and the reality of what will never be. Ricky Nelson was certainly not a priest. Did he deserve to die? No one should be killed because of poor choices they make. Coming up, a blood-soaked crime scene leads to more questions than answers. This, by no means, is a typical homicide case. Hey, man, what are you doing? And it took some effort to discover the truth. Saturday morning, 16-year-old Jessica Barnes is on her way to work at the Chapel Hills Mall. Hey, good morning, Ed. Nice to see you, Jessica. You too. And when she gets to this shoe store that she works in... Hey, Robert. Are you in there? The chain mail is still down in front of it. She's expecting that the store manager is there. Robert! That's weird. So she's wondering why hasn't he opened the door up yet? Robert, I'm here. So she takes her store keys and goes around to the back of the store to unlock the door. When Jessica goes inside... Robert, where are you? She sees her manager's bag sitting there and she thinks, well, maybe he is here. He just hasn't turned the lights on yet. Robert? Robert? <laughs> <laughs> As she's calling out for her manager, she all of a sudden slips on something on the floor. Ew. Inside in the meantime. 